All right, everybody, this is Ross Ratty, and welcome back to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast-style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits and a lot about vegetables, um, how to use some of that stuff in the kitchen, and also how to grow it. And more importantly, some of the more weird and interesting or rare fruits and vegetables that you guys have probably never heard of. So uh, right now in this episode, I want to talk to you guys about a couple things. One, we're going to talk about not necessarily the hungry gap because there is a, a gap in um, many people who grow food. There's a gap of no food that most people experience um, that happens sometime in the early parts of the year when you have a, you're running out of your food that you may have stored over the winter time and uh, it's just a bit too early in the season to really get anything substantial out of your garden um, or the orchard so you end up having this hungry gap this gap of really having no food um, for me I sort of have a hungry gap which seems like almost every year sometime in July and I don't know necessarily why that is it's probably partly my fault. Um, it's also probably partly what I'm growing. Um, how, I guess, much time I have to dedicate towards growing food. Um, but I, we're going to talk about this particular gap, this hungry gap that I experience personally. Um, and what it is that we can do to kind of fill that gap and what's kind of coming next. Uh, because we've talked about in prior episodes of Fruit Talk. Last episode, we talked about some plans for our fall garden. So we're kind of planting now and preparing now for the fall garden. Um, but the prior two episodes, we talked about our spring fruits, the fruits that we harvest in the earlier part of the spring. And then the last part of the spring, we harvest a whole different set of fruits. And those fruits are actually kind of now going into the summer. Now that we are officially into the summer, the summer solstice has arrived. Um, at the beginning of the summer, I at least um, am having some sort of shortage of food here in this yard. I, maybe it's just this year, but I do remember having prior years having a similar issue. But we're going to talk about that, and then um, I also want to talk about what some of my plans are for growing different um, fruit trees and fruiting plants um, in the upcoming seasons. What I'm going to actually plant and try to focus my attention on um, this fall. We're going to do some planting, and I'm already preparing for that. You know, Preparing and planning is the best way that you can become a better gardener and have a more successful season. Um, through careful observation and planning is probably the two best ways that you can get better at growing food. So we're going to already start looking into this and thinking about what are some of the things I want to acquire, um, different, different fruit trees I want to get into, things like persimmons and pears and, um, and plums we're going to be looking particularly at, and also apricots as well. Um, because I just lost one of my apricot trees. But um, yeah, so let's talk about this gap here for a minute. Um, now, we did talk about, as I mentioned, the last couple episodes of Fruit Talk, we mentioned some of the fruits that we've been ripening. And this photo here really accurately depicts the fruits that I was ripening or are ripening currently. And um, what I'll tell you is that the currents here are still sort of going. Um, they're one of those fruits that you have to really process though. I don't necessarily go out of my way or necessarily enjoy them all that much in terms of eating them fresh. So I don't know if I can really count them. Um, the honeyberries are sort of actually, if I had more of them, I would be harvesting and eating a lot more honeyberries at this current moment. Um, as we talked about the honeyberry in last week's episode. I'm getting some alpine strawberries here and there, nothing crazy. Uh, the regular type strawberries are pretty much done. Um, they take a three week hiatus and then they pick up sometime around uh, late July to early um, August. 
the blueberries are kicking in and I've been harvesting a lot of blueberries, um, eating handfuls of them every day. But I'll tell you that uh, the birds found them and I didn't realize that the birds were getting as many as they were. And now I'm sort of behind on my blueberry crop. Um, so in the last couple of days, I haven't really been eating blueberries. I netted them to protect them and keep the birds away. Um, so everything will be fine from here on out, but you know, it just goes to show you that, uh, the birds can cause some serious damage. Um, additionally, the gooseberries are coming in and they're still a bit further away. I could wait a couple weeks before I really get a, a decent harvest off of those. Um, I imagine by mid July, those will be in full force. The raspberries, the first crop on the floricanes, um, they're also coming in, but they're pretty much ending now. Um, the plants, um, the floricanes themselves, once they fruit for that second time, that's what classifies them as a floricane, they fruit twice. They fruit the following season. Uh, well, not necessarily twice because you may have a variety that doesn't fruit in the fall, but most raspberries that you can find nowadays will fruit in the fall and in the spring, or I should say, and in the summer. And um, that summer crop is now ending. And the canes themselves, once they fruit that summer crop, they start to die. And you have to actually cut out the the flora canes um, to let the primate canes come through and then fruit sometime around August 1st. So there is a gap in the strawberries that it really is depicted well in the strawberries, I think, um, where it happens sort of now where there is a gap. And also with the strawberry, there's a gap and then it picks up again in August. Um, the Gumi is actually seemingly a very, has a very wide harvest window because they do dry up pretty well on the plant. However, I'm seeing this year that they're not really um, liking, I think, the humidity and some of them are starting to ferment. Um, so if I really want them to be dried and get that that gummy bear state that they can achieve, um, I need to probably pull them all off. And I think I'm going to do that tomorrow. I'm going to do probably some sort of video tomorrow on the, the gummy berries. Also evaluate them and determine whether or not I can really um, afford to to leave them on a bit longer or if I have to harvest them all right then and there. So the point is, is that my yard is really starting to slow down in terms of, um, in terms of fruit. Now there is quite a bit of vegetables. I would be seeing at this time, a lot of broccoli, potentially even some cabbage some Brussels sprouts. I would be, um, I am seeing a lot of carrots. I'm seeing, um, a lot of the annual vegetables come in the radishes, the turnips, um, you know, you could probably even at this point do some early harvests of onions, maybe early harvests of potatoes. Um, the garlic, obviously it came in, the shallots have come in. Um, you would get onions. Actually, you would get a giant harvest of onions. Now that I think about it, if you plant them in the fall and you'd harvest them in the, uh, in the spring, um, so those would be coming in. A lot of things in terms of vegetables, the beans, the um, the string beans are coming in, the different types of French beans that I'm growing here. Um, I imagine relatively soon I may even get some soybeans for some edamame. The sugar snap peas are now done. The arugula is done. A lot of the lettuces at this point and things that really like the cooler weather are also done uh, because it now we're reaching that summer solstice. Actually, we reached it now. So that really sends a signal to a lot of cool loving crops like my Swiss chard that are just going to see they're bolting and that's just their life cycle. So um, it's difficult to grow uh, some of these cool loving crops at this time of the year. Um, even though I'm getting some significant harvests off of quite a bit of these annuals that I mentioned, um, there is a gap and there is a delay between a lot of the heat loving crops that I'm able to harvest. So um, the heat loving crops that I'm growing like peppers, eggs, eggplants, um, ground cherries, tomatoes, corn, squash, uh, melons, 
you know, all these things require um, a lot more time. And there is a gap, whether it's as obvious as it's as it is with the uh, with the fruits. There is a gap with the annual vegetables, and um, I will just say that I think this time of the year <laughs> is driving me a little insane because I was eating about seventy percent of my diet was fruits um, from my yard. Um, so I'm tired of. Uh, of having to compromise here and settling for other things like uh, I've been eating a lot of dates and uh, bananas um, even a couple apples here and there uh, the the mulberries are coming in and I think that's sort of where I may end up seeing some relief in future years maybe I just it's just for whatever reason I stopped growing certain crops and that would have filled this particular gap quite nicely um, so things like the mulberry which are now starting up again right we just grafted a few of the the mulberries this year the Girardi dwarf mulberry uh, we also have some Marion berry plants that are coming in and if I had my blackberries still which were in crazy number and sheer force those things would be putting out fruit right now um, and would be continuing for most of July. Um, the same thing if we would have avoided potentially a frost uh, and I had maybe more mature plum trees and more mature apricot trees. Um, I would be seeing apricots, I'd be seeing plums right now. Um, sometime in July, it's not unheard of to actually get some very early apples to ripen. So. Um, I should be expecting some apples. I would even be expecting maybe even some early peaches to ripen around mid-July. Um, the cherries as well, which never end up really working out for me. We would have cherries. Um, definitely on the ground cherries or the bush cherries. Definitely on the, the Bing type cherries um, if the birds didn't get most of them. So it just kind of goes to show you that I think for whatever reason, certain things got hit hard, I guess, that could fill this gap for me. And I just this year don't have those particular fruits um, in the quantity or even don't have them at all, which is, uh, yeah, it's a bit disappointing. So I think that kind of explains what I'm going through right now. <laughs> And I wanted to to share to share that with you guys, and then you got things in the fall that ripen, like the pawpaw, the jujube, the persimmon, the fig. Um, you got the grape, the muscadine grape. Um, maybe you could say the European grape is more of a summer fruit, early fall. Um, what else you got? Uh, the the pomegranate. I don't know if I mentioned that. So, you know, the fall is filled with fruits in my yard and right now in this early part of the summer I'm just you know putting my hand my head my hand to my my face and just doing a face palm you know um, so it is what it is but let's talk about now some of the things that I really want to grow more of in the future in terms of some fruiting plants um, which can really relate well I guess to this part of the the season right so if I'm missing some particular fruits during this time of the year I'd want to then plant more of those particular fruits to then be able to harvest more of those particular fruits at this time of the year um, although some of the things we're going to mention don't necessarily ripen at this time of the year uh, um, I still am thinking about them in the back of my mind um, certainly in the case without a doubt of the the marion berry will come in as i mentioned the plums and the apricots will come in the bush cherries and the cherries will come in in higher quantity um in the future around that time around this time um so what are some of the things that i'm thinking about growing and you know we did a episode i think of fruit talk you know in the fall um thinking about what we're going to plant then in the spring and you know those are really the two main times to be planting fruit trees is actually in the spring and the fall and I would argue the best time to plant things are actually in the fall so um, it's not like it's too late or anything or 
or this may be a bad time planting things in the fall, I would argue it's actually the best time of the year in my location to be planting anything. Um, there's just a ton of rain um, that always comes in right after you do your planting and you don't even have to water things in, you know. Um, so that's my big argument there. And because of that, we are thinking about this now. And uh, I'm not necessarily thinking about this in terms of, well, I guess I sort of am. In terms of things I really need, you know, um, I don't necessarily need any of this though, I guess you could say. Um, this, These are more like luxury items. And as I was sort of getting to in that prior episode of Fruit Talk that we did in the fall, talking about what we're going to plant in the spring is that we almost planted nothing. I really came up with close to very little things that I decided really strongly that I wasn't going to plant much of anything because one, we're trying to focus on fig production for commercial sale. Two, um, I'm running out of room. There really isn't any room. And until I really decide of what I want to get rid of, to then put new things in, I have to wait, right? I'm coming to some conclusions here very soon about what it is that I want to get rid of. So therefore, I'm getting a really good idea of what I want to take out and then I can then have this new room to then put in some things that I want to obviously put in. So um, some of the things that are coming to mind here is actually pears. and. I have plenty of pear trees. I actually have um, I have five. I have seven pear trees. I have two Asian pears, which are my favorites uh, between the Europeans and the Asians, and I have five Asian or five European pears. So you would think, well, I must be crazy, right? Um, yeah, you, you could you could you could say that. Um, that's plenty of pear trees for any one person or even a family of four, even a large family. And, you know, years down the road, you're just going to have so many pears, you're not really going to know what to do with them all. Um, it is nice that they store well, so I'm not really concerned about that. The fact that they do store well is a big bonus. Um, so, again, I'm not really concerned about having too much of those fruits, but. Um, these fruit trees that I want to plant are more about quality of life or more about luxury, I should say. I'm sorry. The the Kamas pear is a pear that I've really, really enjoyed. Um, you can get them at Harry and David, I think is the, the website. They sell fruit and you normally see them around Christmas time and people send them out in these big packages. They have some really quality pears that they grow. And they put a lot of care and attention to the apples they grow and the pears, but particularly... I've been very impressed with their pears, especially the really high quality ones that uh, that they really package in a certain way. They have like the gold wrapping on them. I'm sure some of you guys have probably eaten them before. Um, I would even I would even recommend that you just buy them for yourself, not even just like a gift to somebody else. Is just get yourself some Kamas pears from Harry and David, and. Because they're so good, it really inspired me to grow commas pears myself. I never got a tree, just never got around to it. I don't even know really how easy it is to grow commas pears. They may be quite fire blight. They may be very susceptible to fire blight. I looked them. I actually looked this up, and you know, a lot of these pears unfortunately say that they are fire blight resistant, but. The, it's necessarily doesn't mean that that's the case. Um, there's definitely some levels to that fire blight resistance. I have only had one pair that's gotten some fire blight at this point, but all of them are listed as fire blight resistant. So one of them did end up dying because of the fire blight. And I would not be surprised if Comus or any of the other pairs I have eventually get fire blight. Um, so Comus, uh, again, don't really know much about the, the tree itself or the growing characteristics itself. I'm growing it very simply because it produces an incredible European pear. 
and I want to be able to see if I can replicate that here in this climate. And instead of having to order from Harry and David every year, <laughs> why not grow them yourself, right? Um, additionally, I don't necessarily know if my other pears that I'm growing, because I've got some pretty fancy smancy pear varieties here, guys. I've got uh, the Europeans, you got Harrow Delight and Harrow Sweet. A lot of people brag and really say that they're very, very good pears. So do I necessarily need Commas? Probably not. I just want to know for myself what the deal is with these pears. And Commas is one that I've always thought about growing. Do I necessarily have a great spot for it? No. Um, the Korean giant pear is another Asian pear that I actually had at one time. It is one of the most fire, bl fire blight resistant pears. I do, I would actually be more inclined probably to plant a Korean giant pear simply because I really, really, really like Asian pears. It's one of my favorite fruits. Um, definitely in my top seven that we constantly talk about. Um, at least we're getting, we're talking more and more about it here on the podcast, but uh, the Korean giant pear, I do have to say, is one that I, I really would consider growing, and I think a lot of you guys probably should as well. Um, now, losing one of my Asian pears, as I mentioned, to fire blight, I think I want to replace one. You know, I think I'd rather have a, a Korean giant pear somewhere than not, and that's just sort of luxury, right? Do I need it? Not necessarily. <laughs> Got two Asian pear trees. <laughs> yeah, so um, let's see. What else we got here? So another thing I really want to focus on is uh, is persimmons. Love the fruit. It is my favorite fruit. So the persimmon and the fig are the ones we really go to the furthest lengths for. And I'll tell you, I'm really sort of at a loss in a way with these persimmons. Um, it's hard to really wrap my head around exactly what it is that I should be looking for in the future to really you know, put my attention towards in terms of these different varieties. I'll tell you that I did sort of make a little bit of an error in the varieties that I decided to grow. Um, and I wish I had sort of really knew more about persimmons in the beginning before I planted them. Um, I would have known and really did everything right. I probably would have more fruit at this point than I do now. And, uh, you know, my Rosianca persimmon in the front of the house is my oldest. It's six years old now and it's sixth season. It's just not putting out the fruit qu uh, quantity that I expected it to at this age. Um, it's still dropping flowers. It's a huge tree. It doesn't have any issues, at least that I can tell, with nutrients, with water. Um, it actually has less pest pressure this year. It had probably close to 500 flowers, if not more, on it this year. About 95% of those flowers have dropped, maybe even more than that. I'd be lucky if I get 20 to 50 fruits off of that tree. I'd be lucky if I get really anything. Um, so it's just disappointing that you get a variety like that that um, puts out great fruits. I love the fruits. Um, however, there's just a couple things wrong with it. Of course, the fruit dropping being the number one thing, but it also ripens quite late. Um, a lot of the persimmons ripen into the winter time, which I'm not necessarily really haven't made up my mind as to whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. It is nice to have fresh fruit on the tree going into the winter. Um, as Michael McConkie had shown us in his uh, persimmon video that I think we may have talked about in an episode of Fruit Talk, believe it or not. Um, he showed us the different sizes and when they ripen. 
in his yard in his at his orchard in in Virginia and I'll tell you Tecumseh was one that really stood out to me which uh, ripens a lot of its fruit actually into the spring of the following season so you get fruit in like March potentially even April um, fresh from a persimmon which means you're basically getting fruit off of persimmons if you have enough varieties really starting sometime in August uh, because the earliest varieties that you can grow like Proc and Gil Ya they'll ripen sometime in August um, and then you can get a harvest window all the way over until March which is insane is that not insane is that not the craziest thing you've ever heard um so that would how many months is that that's basically september october november december january february march that's seven months guys of fruit off of a off of a fruit tree that's it's just crazy now i may not even need a seven month harvest window because you can dry them you can hang them up and do hoshigaki like we did last season which was we talked about in another episode of fruit talk which is an absolute joke how easy it is how simple it is also how incredibly good they are and the dried persimmon in the dried form dried fruit lasts a very long time probably um, longer than seven months if I which would probably even lengthen that seven months maybe into May or even June maybe I'd be eating dried persimmons to this day I don't I don't know I ate them all <laughs> um so you know uh i'm not entirely sure as i mentioned what for some varieties i really want to go for but another big thing to consider is the size of the tree i thought hardiness would be a big thing and i thought flavor would be a big thing but really i think the bigger things to mention here is the size of the tree the things to think about i should say is the size of the tree um how often it drops fruit you know, is this variety going to be more precocious than other varieties? And also, when does it ripen? You know, there's a lot of value in Proc, a lot of value in Gil Ya as the first persimmons you can eat. You know, there's a lot of value probably in Giro or the Giro types that are some of the first non-astringent persimmons that you can eat, like an apple. You know, um... I wouldn't necessarily say there's a whole lot of value in a backyard orchard in a persimmon tree that's 20 feet tall or even 25 feet tall. You don't want that. You don't want to have to deal with that. You don't, um, you want to be able to control that. And if you have to prune your persimmon tree to keep it a smaller size, to keep it around 15 feet, then you're kind of, uh, you may end up in that situation maybe that's affecting the dropping of the flowers and the persimmon i don't know the fact that i have to keep the size of the tree really in check every year of my rosianca i don't i don't know but i certainly don't want a persimmon tree that's 20 feet tall by 15 feet wide that's just too big um that just uh you know really becomes difficult to harvest it it uh it takes up more space than i want and it's also probably too close to my house so it's uh it's just quite difficult i think wrapping my head around all this basically i think i need more experience with persimmons more time observing them um to really get the brightest picture but at the end of the day we're gonna know what varieties we really want you know um we're going to have a really good handle on that. Now, originally I thought, like I said, I wanted some varieties that had the best flavor. Things like Seijo and Honan Red and um, maybe you can even make an argument for Smith's Best. Um, I personally find that the flavor on all of them is ridiculous. So, you know, Seijo is like the best, the best one. It, that's, I mean, that's what it even means in Korean is the very best one. Um, and I think I would, I would really like to have a Seijo persimmon. I actually have two of them now in the ground, but 
you know, it's get, the Seijo gets to like 15, 20 feet tall. So do I really want a Seijo? Um, I don't know. Uh, I have trying to graft Honan Red. Do I really want a Honan Red tree? Is it going to be as hardy? Is it going to be hardy in my location? Is it going to survive zero degrees Fahrenheit? Maybe even slightly less than that in a, in a polar vortex year? I don't know. Um, so, you know, that really is sort of the, the, the questions that are coming to mind here. And I'll tell you, I did order a Gil Ya from uh, Edible Landscaping. And they had talked about this, Michael McConkey in his tour, he talked about it being the earliest ripening Asian persimmon. That's also astringent, which to me is a big win. Proc is a big win. Um, so Gil Ya should be a big win. Now, I really would like to have a Nikita's gift. And the reason I want to have a Nikita's gift is if you looked at Michael McConkie's Nikita's gift tree, you'll see that the fruits are obviously very tasty. I've heard about this and that Nikita's gift becomes very, very red over time. That red color should indicate some really good flavor. I would be shocked if it didn't have a really great flavor. In addition, it's a hybrid, meaning it's very hearty. In addition, it has more of a Asian persimmon quality to it. So it's a very hearty Asian persimmon. Additionally, the size of the tree is quite dwarf like an Asian persimmon. So you don't, this would be honestly the perfect persimmon if I really thought about it. It's extremely hearty. It uh, is astringent, like I, like I love them. I like the astringent types. It's got some decent size to it, right? It's not the biggest fruit. It'll survive pretty much every winter we have here. Um, and it's dwarf. It, it is easy to control. And the fruit um, becomes redder and redder as the winter goes by, as the, uh, the, the winter months go by. Now, would this persimmon be a variety unfortunately that you could maybe sell or market here in this location in the philadelphia area i don't know because you'd have to harvest the persimmon when it's hard because you got to sell these astringent persimmons hard unless you're going to sell them as hoshigaki as a dried persimmon um but i don't think you could sell this one fresh you would have to probably pick it before it's ripe and then it would not necessarily be really something that someone would want to buy um because it's not necessarily ripe and because it's so far away from being ripe because they really do end up getting ripe in like january you know um in december so if we're if we're picking them before frost, which is what you'd have to do, you'd have to pick them before the frost um, at the latest, then I don't know if it necessarily would work out. I just, I really don't, I don't see it. I, I, obviously, I need to know, I need to have more experience with this this kind of thing, but um, at least in terms of a commercial fruit here, it doesn't seem like it would make it would make much sense. And that's part of what I'm looking for with some of these persimmon varieties is um, what one do I think would actually have some commercial potential here? Um, because I'm not necessarily that interested uh, or only interested, I should say, in growing them for myself. I would like to sell the fruit at some point in the future. Um, so that's, those are the two varieties I'm really looking at. And then I've gone over basically all the different varieties I have, like Sejo and, and I think I have a Great Wall, Miss Kim and, you know, um, I think I have a, an Izu or something like an Izu. Um, so, you know, I wanted to see what the size of these trees are and basically I've learned that my persimmon trees are going to be huge. <laughs> a lot of the persimmons where I had them or have planted them will just take over that whole area. And um, 
it's going to be interesting to see what this is all sort of like in the future uh, in different spots that I have some of these things because it just – it's going to be too pack, too packed in there. It's going to be too – everything's going to be too close together. And uh, inevitably, it would – if I leave it all in there, it would become a, probably a giant mistake. But am I going to leave it all in there? Um, probably not. Um, so anyway, the next fruit I'm thinking about growing is, and I want to grow more of, is actually the apricot and the plum. And they're so tricky. I don't even know why I'm really putting too much stock into these things. Um, I'm not necessarily planting more trees of them. I'm thinking more in the sense of grafting more varieties onto my plum trees, um, onto my apricot trees. So... I do have a couple spots. I have about three spots of plums and apricots I can plant that wouldn't necessarily take up any more room than they're already taking up. So that's a nice bonus, a nice thing there. But most of these will be grafted. And I've learned that there is probably some different types of apricots maybe you could look into. I don't necessarily care all that much because I really like early blush. Um, that one really impressed me. And I would just rather have as many of those as possible because <laughs> it's such an amazing fruit. Again, one of my absolute favorite fruits. In fact, I was having a wine today for anyone that's interested. I was having a wine tonight. Uh, it's called, uh, it's a Sauvignon Blanc. I don't know what it's actually. The guy's name is Rod Easthope, 2009 Reserve. And uh, this is one of the best white wines I've ever had. I really enjoyed this. It was um, quite acidic, quite dry, and it tasted to me a lot like apricots. And it says here on the back, um, notes of gooseberry, elderflower, fennel. I guess goose, gooseberry is pretty accurate um, now, that I, now that it mentions that, but I was getting a really good sense of apricot in this wine. And... Um, you know, that's just my personal taste review on it. But, uh, you know, back to the apricots, I just love the apricot. So um, I'm thinking about obviously putting more of those in, especially after, like I said, losing an apricot tree. I don't know why it's dying, but it's just suddenly dying. It's just having a sudden demise. I had a, a peach in a very similar location and it's pretty much in the same spot that also died just out of the blue. So maybe there's something going on that I'm not thinking of. There is also a, pl a peach that I want to plant. Um, now that I'm thinking about this, um, this is why we do these episodes of Fruit Talk. As you think it's for you, it's for me. Um, it's called the Indian Free Peach. And I have the Indian clingstone peach no I do have Indian free so I'm looking for the Indian blood peach yes now the Indian blood peach I believe is quite similar to the Indian free or maybe it's just in the name but I'll tell you the Indian free has got that really awesome red coloring in the flesh, which is a big deal. Uh, people love that sh that stuff. Uh, now, if I look at the Indian blood peach and you look at the flesh, it's also red. So that's, I guess, where they're, they are similar is they got that red flesh to them. So I would like to really try and grow the Indian blood peach, which is a clingstone. It's not a free, freestone peach like the Indian free peach is. But I'd like to see if I can get some cyan wood of this and, uh, and graft it onto one of my peaches. Why not? Um, I'm sure it's not the easiest one to grow. However, it should have a, a different flavor, right? Now, that sort of brings me then to the plums because the plums I've been so, I think, uh, in the dark about, really probably more than any other fruit. 
And we've never actually talked. I would like to have a separate episode just on plums because there's so many types of plums. There's there's beach plums, there's Chickasaw plums, there's uh, Japanese plums, there's European plums. Within the uh, Japanese plums, there's even types of different types of plums. I had a beach plum in Japan, believe it or not. That was really not that great, but you know that maybe is even a different type of plum. Um, I've also had, there's probably even tons of different species of plums now that I'm really thinking about it, but I also had, uh, or I should say there's also within the European types of plums is a very diverse set of plums. And, uh, Scott F. Smith, for anyone that knows Scott Smith on growingfruit.org, this is one of the fruit growing communities I recommend. I highly recommend growingfruit.org. I know a lot of my viewers are actually a part of this community. Um, as I put this link to growingfruit.org in the description of every video I think I've ever put out on YouTube. Um, and maybe people found it on their own. I don't know. But uh, the point is, is that I highly recommend the, uh, the group and Scott Smith has really put in a lot of time into growing fruits in the Northeast and, and you know, really um, seeing what works here and what doesn't and uh, really assessing the disease. And he's someone I've always looked at um, for advice on different varieties and what how different things do well or don't do well here. Anyway, the guy for a hobbyist really knows his stuff on stone fruits and apples and pears, it seems like, most temperate fruits. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he's he gone through here in this post on growingfruit.org. I'll put this in the description if I remember. And he does uh, go through this and mention the different types of European plums. And uh, there's things called gauge plums, um, which – in my opinion, I was or I was recommended highly to these types of gauge plums, which are a bit more disease prone than other types. And you can tell by looking at them, they're very different in appearance. There's also different types of them. Um, they have a different flavor. And uh, without a doubt, this is one plum I think everybody should at least try to grow. It's going to be very difficult. You may have to just repeatedly keep grafting these things until one of them eventually succeeds and you get something reasonable. But, you know, um, it's a wonderful, wonderful tasting plum. And I would really like to get my green gauge to a point where it's going to fruit. I think it did flower this year, but uh, obviously nothing held on because the trees are just too young. So there's also uh, the prune plums, which is another type of uh, European plum. And I have a, a, a prune plum called, um, let's see here. Um, let's see if we can find some images of this. Yeah, so here we go. Here's some different ones here. I have one just that's simply called Italian prune plum. One that's pretty popular is called Stanley. There's uh, They go by many names, these things, and they have... Um, they've been breeding them and trying to, you know, cross them and and really produce some interesting prune plums. There is one that really comes to mind that I really am uh, looking forward to is one called Valer. I think it's a prune plum, but I could be totally wrong on this. Um, Adams County Nursery has a really good selection of plums that I'm going to be probably trying to get as many of them as I can. Um, of the European types, and if not, I'll, I'll try to find some scion wood if I can if I can find some. Um, but it says here that uh, yeah, it doesn't say whether or not it is or is not a prune plum. But I have heard from uh, respectable growers that it produces an insanely high bricks on this particular variety. So. I had one, and then I think it actually got some root knot nematodes, which was really strange um, that that is even possible. Um, 
you know, I should really look into why these trees, the peat, the the peach I got and the apricot I got, and also now this uh, this plum that I got. I wonder where they all came from, and I wonder if, uh, yeah, yeah, early blush. Where is that? Came from Adams County Nursery. Yeah. So did my. What was it? Oh, the Valor Plum also came from Adams County Nursery. And what was that peach that I lost? I think it was the Indian Blood Peach. Well, no, it was a Contender Peach from Burnt Ridge. And uh, that one died probably for a, uh, it died for a different reason because the uh, it got stripped. The bark got stripped on it. Uh, by rabbits or something chewed up the bark yeah but that's weird that I have two trees now from Adams County Nursery that just suddenly croaked on me but I will um, inspect the roots on this uh, early blush tree and see if maybe there's root knot nematodes I, don't, I asked them why there would be root knot nematodes because I don't normally have them here but maybe something happened I don't know Maybe uh, I, maybe the the roots were in contact with my Valor plum. I don't remember because I think I did have a couple of those trees in the same pot with the Valor plum, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe the early blush was also with it, and it also has root knot nematodes. How I got root knot nematodes to begin with, I don't know. That's a giant question there. Anyway. Let's get back to these, these plum types. So the prune plums, these are the plums that you normally use for prunes. I mean, hence the name, right? They're often pretty sweet. They dry pretty well. They have a certain shape to them. Um, usually they're more oval shaped and uh, they have larger pits to them. So yeah, it's, it's quite interesting using them as a prune plum to then turn into prunes which would be great or just simply eating them fresh regardless they're really good plums and I would just highly recommend that you guys try them out um, now there's other types here let's keep going down Scott's list uh, he calls them perdrigon plums uh, I don't even know what these are the Perdragon plums constitute an old but comparatively unimportant group of plums. <laughs> Name comes from the old time geographical division of Italy. Um, da, 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 da. Since they are not grown much in what was formerly the province of Touraine, France, they are sometimes called Touraine plums. Um, Well, not much is really on them, he's he's mentioning here. But I guess they are a different type of plum that's sort of just old and uh, no longer really grown in, um, in much widespread uh, importance, I guess. Now, there's also another type of plum that he mentions here as the yellow egg plums. And um, he says there's certain varieties, there are a few varieties that grow, that belong to this group and they're very distinct some of the largest and most handsome plums the origin of varieties of this group can be traced back over three centuries and it is somewhat remarkable that the size and beauty of the yellow egg plums have not tempted growers during this time to produce a greater number of similar varieties um, so I have seen some yellow egg plums and I thought maybe I should get one I just know that they're quite difficult to grow and I never really felt um, to, um, in, you know, convinced that I should grow one. Um, but let's look at them here. There's one called uh, Golden Drop, which I know quite well of. But if we look at the, uh, let's look up a yellow egg plum. We'll see some varieties here. I know some of them have like spots on them, uh, if I'm not mistaken. They're really pretty. 
Uh, they almost look like a prune plum, but yellow. Um, oddly enough, at least to me. Very beautiful plums. And I'm sure they have a different flavor to them. I wonder if Scott will break down his thoughts on the flavor at some point. I'd like to ask him about that. He also mentions there's another group here called the Imperatrice Plums. This poorly defined assemblage of varieties. Dark blue color, heavy bloom, medium size, and oval shape are chief characters characteristics. It's impossible to trace the origin of the group. Um, the Imperatrice, which is an offspring, seems to have been one of the first of the blue plums to receive general recognition. Um, don't know much about these plums, I'll tell you that. And I don't think they're really grown all that much. So uh, let me just see here if this even comes up in Google to really have a, a different, yeah, I guess this is, now this is a black diamond plum. I don't even know what that is. Looks like a a, uh, a Japanese variety of plum here. All right, then there's also, he mentions here, the Lombard plums. Just as the blue plums have been thrown in the last name group, we may roughly classify a number of red or reddish mottled varieties in one group. So kind of uh, another random group here that he, he sort of puts together. Um, now, I thought there was a Mirabelle, if I'm not mistaken. Let's look up Mirabelle plum because these seem to be quite different. And I wonder what kind of plum these are. And these get a lot of attention. And these are also widely regarded as some of the best tasting plums, Mirabelle plums. And um, these I think are mostly in France, at least that's maybe I guess where they originated. And they've sort of made their way all throughout Europe. They look really good. They look very, very tasty. Um, man. Here we go. Let's see what One Green World has to say. Highly regarded in Europe, this exceptional variety features round yellow fruit with firm, tender, sweet, delectable yellow flesh. Mirabelle plums are great for fresh eating and canning and makes delicious jams and, uh, and baked goods. So, interesting. Kind of reminds me of the Shiro plum. That's a Japanese plum. Maybe they've been crossed at some point. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I'd be interested to try this one as well, this type of plum. And sort of this is all kind of sparked from the varieties of plums I have, is that, as I said, I have a gauge plum, I have a prune plum. The rest I have are Japanese, and um, not too fond of the Japanese plums. I'm going to be honest with you. I have the, uh, the beauty plum which is going to ripen for the first time this year. We'll see if that one has anything decent about it. Um, I find probably I would imagine that a lot of these Japanese plums are quite similar in flavor. I'm not really too keen on them. The Santa Rosa is uh, a standard, so is the Satsuma. The Santa Rosa I have ripened last year it tastes a lot like bazooka bubblegum. Um, that's where that sugar flavor is uh, is coming from and telling me. Um, and that bazooka bubblegum flavor really just isn't that good. I don't really like it all that much. So for me, as I said, not a big fan of the Japanese plum so far. We'll see if the beauty plum comes through and impresses me in some way, but uh, I just have a feeling it's not really going to. Uh, Shiro here, that's what Shiro looks like. And again, I think it's probably reminds me a lot of those Mirabelle plums. Um, and who knows if these beauty plums are really that much different from the other Japanese plums, you know? I don't, I kind of regret that I have as many Japanese plums that I do. So I'll probably graft on top of some of these Japanese plums, um, these other plum varieties that I've, 
I'll be trying to find like uh, like the Mirabelle plum and um, probably another variety of plum that I'll decide on. So that's kind of it here, guys. I hope that this uh, this episode of Fur Talk was really helpful, insightful. You guys got a lot out of this. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review on iTunes. Um, let me know down in the comments. Like the video on YouTube. Please subscribe. Check out our Patreon if you guys want to support the podcast. Go to patreon.com slash Ross Ratty. Greatly appreciate it. Um, any donations, any support is greatly appreciated. Um, and we'll see you guys for next week's episode of Fruit Talk. Thank you for, for joining us once again. Take care, everybody.